Pfeiffer for all of our Pathfinders. If you'll bow your heads with me, and then I'll introduce our speaker and we'll get started. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for each and every one of these Pathfinders and their families from all over the place, and that right now together we can learn about the sanctuary. And Lord, um, you are our high priest in heaven, and we want to learn about you and learn about the priestly sanctuary system in the Bible and the Old Testament and, and how all of that connects with your plan of salvation. So give us wisdom and help us to understand all about the sanctuary that we can the time we have. And bless our special guest, Dr. Davidson. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me introduce our speaker and we'll get started. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Richard Davidson, and he teaches at what's called the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm going to ask him really quick, uh, Dr. Davidson, what is a seminary? A seminary is a school where people come that want to be pastors or full-time workers like uh, chaplains or Bible instructors. So they come here to get training to become pastors. So maybe we even have some people, some pathfinders here that might want to prepare to be a pastor. So that might be something in their future they might want to think about, right? That's right. In fact, I see some people here looking at pictures of people that have been here to the seminary. So, uh, I say hi to all of my fellow former seminary students and uh, their, their children or grandchildren, what have you. Well, and uh, you've been teaching there for quite a few years because I know that when I was in seminary just a few years ago, well, about over two, two decades ago now, um, I, I remember sitting in your class. So you've been teaching there for quite a number of years. Well, I, I tell people that I've been here since a few years after Noah's flood. So mm -hmm. something like that. Well, we're glad to have you. Thank you for being willing to teach this afternoon. His wife, uh, Joanne Davidson, is also a seminary professor. And I remember because I took a class from her on ethics and she's written, a, they both have written a lot of books and articles about the Sabbath and the sanctuary. And when I thought about the sanctuary honor, I thought, why not have like the very best? He's the person, Dr. Davidson's the person who teaches the sanctuary class. In fact, I heard a rumor that you even just wrote like this textbook on the sanctuary too, right? That's right, it should be out this summer, God willing, yeah. So exciting stuff, he's written a lot of stuff on the sanctuary, and so I'm really excited. So welcome Dr. Davidson, thank you for being with all of these Pathfinders here this afternoon. Well, it's a joy to be in this virtual Pathfinder workshop, and I have the privilege of talking about my favorite topic, so, uh, how much better does it get? I consider this as kind of a warm up because tomorrow night I start 28 hours of lecturing on the sanctuary to about 60 uh, pastors around the country and around the world from wherever they zoom into. So, but uh, my favorite group to talk to are my Pathfinder age kids because we can break it down and make it into things that are uh, exciting and fun and I'm going to try to do that and if I don't succeed in some places Mike will help me help me uh, uh, make it uh, make it come alive but we'll have fun together we're gonna have some fun yes yeah, so but I want us I want us to see the bigger picture of the sanctuary for just a few minutes okay because when you think of the word sanctuary what do you think of well you know Sabbath afternoons my family like to go to bird sanctuaries or to uh, sanctuaries for, uh, you know, a wildlife, different kinds of wildlife. It's a place of refuge. It's a place where you can go and feel safe. Uh, but the sanctuary we're going to talk about to Bible, today from the Bible is that, and it's much more than that. It's a place of refuge where God invites us to come, and we'll see how that works out. But it's, it's really a place where God wants to come to us, to be close to us. And so uh, our key text, if you don't remember any other text this next hour and a half, you got to remember this one. And it's one we actually are going to look at a little later, but I'm already going to use it here. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. Uh, in the previous chapter, God had shown Moses a picture of the heavenly sanctuary. He just saw it, just a little 
bit, just the pavement of the heavenly sanctuary. And it, it's so vast and it's so awesome. It's so big. And then God told Moses, now I want you to make a copy of that. L let them make me a sanctuary. Why? So that I may dwell among them. God wanted the sanctuary built because he likes to be close to his people. And here they were out camping in the desert. Did you know God likes to camp? All right. I hope some of you are campers like I am. I love to camp. I love to hike. I love to backpack. And uh, I have a sign in my office that no one sees except me. And when I close the door, I look at it all the time. It says, I'd rather be in the mountains. But uh, so I love to camp. And so the sanctuary is where the children of Israel camped with God for 40 years. Not just a weekend, but got to, got, they got to camp with God, live in tents, and do all that kind of cool stuff that we do once in a while as Pathfinders. They got to do it every day for 40 years. And God got to camp with them. So the, the big picture about the earthly sanctuary is that God wants to be close to, close to us. He wants to really be close. God's a fellow camper, and he loves to travel with Pathfinders and that sanctuary is all about the God who wants to be close to, close to us, whether we're camping or whether we're at home, whether we're quarantined, whether we're stuck at home like I've been for the last month, or whether we're uh, out uh, climbing in the mountains or somewhere else. Hey, but there's Jay an even bigger picture, and that is that this sanctuary on earth, it's not just a tent where God is uh, close to his people when they're camping. It's also a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. And we find it, uh, several places in the Bible, for example, in uh, chap uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, where we read that the priests on earth were serving at a sanctuary, which was a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. So here's this miniature model on earth of the real thing in heaven. It's God's home. We sometimes think of the heavenly sanctuary as the place God is a stern, cold, harsh, judge who's ready to condemn. No, no, no. The heavenly, heavenly sanctuary is about a God who wants to be close to all the people in the universe. And so he's got this great home in heaven, and he invites the angels, he invites the unfallen worlds, and when we get to heaven, we're going to be invited there. In fact, we're going to live, it says, in God's house, in the sanctuary forever. That'll be our city home. But then we'll have our country homes in Texas or Colorado or Michigan or wherever else we're, we're from. But the sanctuary is God's house. It's where he lives. Now, God doesn't need to live in a house. He's big enough. He doesn't have to be enclosed in space and time. But he wants to come down into space and time to be close to us because he loves us. And so it was there in his home where Lucifer, the angel that was a covering cherub right next to the throne of God, where he decided he wanted to rebel from God. And that's another story we won't tell now. And so right there in that heavenly sanctuary is where the great controversy started. And Satan was finally had to be cast down to this earth. And Adam and Eve were tempted by Satan, and they fell. But God did not want to go far away from Adam and Eve. And so right there at the gate of the garden, he established the first sanctuary after the fall. And they came to the garden and offered their sacrifices. And, and we follow the history, all the patriarchs had their altars. And then we come to the time of Egypt and the years in captivity. And then God delivers the people of Israel from, from bondage. And they go across the Red Sea. And then they travel a few more weeks and they get to Mount Sinai. And they're at the foot of this great mountain. I love that mountain. It's my favorite mountain. I've climbed it about 10 times. And I can't wait to get back and climb it again. But right in front of that mountain is a gigantic plain. It's about two miles wide, about one mile, uh, one mile wide and two miles long. Just the spot where God told Moses, I want you to build the sanctuary. And I want you to put it right here. And so God told Moses exactly how to build it. And we have the instructions in Exodus. It takes up many chapters of the book of Exodus. And we are today 
going to look at some of those features of the sanctuary that God made for us to understand who he is, that he wants to be close to us, that he wants to camp with us, but also that we can understand how he wants to save us and how because sin has come in between us and God, he has to solve the sin problem so that we can reestablish our connection with him. So we're going to go camping with God for the next uh, hour or so. Are you ready? And so let's imagine ourselves. And Michael, I invite you to put that picture on the screen of the setting with the camp and the tents all around the camp. And let's just see this picture of what the sanctuary looked like when it was first built. Here it is. Hopefully you can all see it. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it well. Looks good. good. So you can see off in the distance is that mountain, Mount Sinai. Then here are all those tents around it. And I want you to imagine that we are all camping in, in some of those different tents around Mount Sinai. And let's try to make this real. Because the sanctuary, let's, let's just pretend the sanctuary has just been built. And we want to we wanna learn about it. And so God is telling us, now when you wake up tomorrow morning, Sabbath morning, I want to give you a tour of the sanctuary. Ah, oh, that's even closer. Okay, good. So the first thing, when we wake up, we wake up to a sound. And it's the sound of the shofar, the, the horn of the ram or the horn of the wild goat that's calling us to come and worship. Well, I happen to have a, a shofar. And so uh, maybe the screen can go off for just a minute while I pull off my show, right. shofar. And uh, here is the ram's horn shofar. And uh, this one is uh, a smaller uh, version of what was blown. Then I also have this big one. This is the, the huge shofar. You can see it's a, an ibex. And it's a wild antelope. And so let's hear the the priest blowing us blowing the sound to call us to the sanctuary and i'll give one blast on the ram's horn and then i'll give one blast on the big kudu horn so here we go calling us to the sanctuary Is everyone awake? <laughs> Just in case people are trying to sleep in, we got to hear the big kudu horn that will call us one more. Give us the second blast. In, in case you put the snooze alarm on, this will be the second alarm. Okay, here we go. It's Sabbath, and we get to go to the sanctuary. So let's head, let's head down to the sanctuary. Get that picture back on, can you, Dr. Campbell, please? I gotcha. Okay. And as we look at this picture, we see that uh, right over, uh, can, you, can you see my uh, cursor going over this screen? Can everyone see the cursor? Can you see it, Michael? No, I bet you tell me where you want it. Okay, that's right. Okay, it's down. Just no, just put the cursor down by the curtain, the oh, inside curtain. Okay, in there. No, back here, uh, uh, toward the front of the courtyard. The courtyard. Oh, over here. Yeah. So okay, we're all going to go that? into the in through these beautiful curtains, and we'll come into this first part. And you notice the first question is to name the three parts of the sanctuary. So here we are, we're gonna go entering the sanctuary and the first part when we enter is called the courtyard. And it's this whole area. It's, uh, you can imagine two big squares and this is the front square that faces toward the east and then there's the back square which, faces, which is where the, the actual tent is. 
And then you see the priest that's ready to go into the next part of the sanctuary, and that is going into the holy place. And we will find out in just a minute what's into the holy place. But he goes into the holy place, and he is, you notice he's a regular priest. He doesn't have on the high priest's vestments, so he can only go into the holy place. But now we, we, we want to imagine, and he will tell, uh, the high priest will have to t uh, tell us about what's going into the third place of the sanctuary. The very inner part is a square, like a cube, in fact. It's as long as it is wide as it is high, 10 cubits each. And if you want to figure out exactly that measurement, we have now, the archaeologists have found in the tomb of the chief architect of Moses' time, they found his tomb and they found his stick, which measures how much is a cubit. It's 20.6 inches. So you take 20.6 inches times 10 and then divide it by 12 and you, uh, you'll have how many feet it is exactly. We're not gonna go into all, the, all those measurements. But that inner room, the shape of a cube is called the most holy place. So the answer to our first question here is very simple. Here's the courtyard, then the holy place, and then the most holy place. Now the next question, so now we, we're, we're going to ask the priest as we're coming in, well, so tell us about this. Tell us about what's here in the courtyard. So we go to the courtyard and we look and we see these articles of furniture. There's the fire that's coming up off of the first article of furniture, which is called the altar of burnt offering. It's made out of bronze. And that is where there was always a sacrifice, a, a burnt offering that was burning night and day, 24 seven, to represent that, that we are always dependent upon the blood of Jesus. It's because of his blood that we are able to be saved. And then we go into the next uh, move a little further to the west toward the tent, and there is that laver. Now we're gonna look, yeah, there's the laver, okay. Uh, now I think probably the best thing, uh, Dr. Campbell, is since uh, I think you have each one listed, right? You have a picture of each one? Yes. So why don't we just go to those pictures, and we, we've looked at the two things, the two articles of furniture that are in the courtyard. There's the altar of burnt offering. So that's where the sacrifice was. And the, um, we've already described how the altar of burnt offering was where the sacrifices were brought, where the animal was laid, and where it represented Represent, all of this represents Jesus. That's the beautiful thing about the sanctuary. Every single piece represents something about Jesus. And so it's just one beautiful, beautiful mosaic of Jesus and his love for us. This represents Jesus, our sacrifice. It represents Calvary. In fact, in Hebrews 13, it, uh, Paul says, we have an altar. And then he goes on to talk about the cross. So when Jesus died on the cross, he was actually like the lamb that was dying on this altar of burnt offering. So let's move to the next one then, to the next article of furniture. Here's the bronze laver. The bronze laver was made from mirrors that were taken from the women. The, the mirrors were not made out of glass in those days. They were made out of polished brass or bronze made so smooth that then you could see your reflection and the, the, the women donated their mirrors and made the laver out of that so that they reflected. And this was of course where the priest uh, washed his feet before he went into the sanctuary. And when they first started the services, he actually washed his whole, his whole body was washed. But then ever after that, it was his uh, feet that were washed when they went into the sanctuary. And so this is a wonderful symbolism of Jesus, who is the, the water of life, who is the one who cleanses us from all of our sins. He's the one who is actually in Titus chapter 3. He's called, in, in Greek it says, he is our laver. He's the one who cleanses us. And so this symbolizes baptism. When we are baptized 
and we are washed, our sins are washed away in baptism. And then every time we participate in the Lord's Supper, uh, we do the, the foot washing. This is like the priests. Every time they went into the sanctuary, they washed their feet. And so we have this, this beautiful picture. Okay. Um, now we have a section on the coverings, but I think let's just go ahead and do the furniture first. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna skip question number three. We'll come back to that since we're doing the, uh, the furnishings. And um, then we'll, uh, then, then we will come back and do, do the coverings. Let's see, Am I, is, that, is that what I'm gonna do? Actually, oh, I think- so That might I think, make it easier. Yeah, because the covering sort of, uh, although, you know, actually, come to think of it, I think you have the picture, that first picture that has all the coverings. So let's just do a break before we go inside the temple, inside the sanctuary. Let's go back, yeah, and just show, you see the, the curtain, the, the, the cover of the tent. It actually has four different layers. And let's, let's talk about these layers and then we'll go inside and we'll see the rest, I think, because that's the next, that's actually the next question. The next question here on our study sheet is how many coverings were there over the sanctuary? List the type of coverings in order from inside to outside and what each covering represents. So how many? Four, four coverings. There's first the inner one. We can't see it from here, but you, so you just have to imagine it. It was made of red, yarn and blue yarn and purple yarn, wool, wool yarn that was woven together with white linen. And so it was this beautiful fabric of blue and red and purple and white. And then it had the designs of cherubim, of angels made out of little uh, threads of pure gold that were sewn into the, not only the curtain in front, but to the ceiling. That first layer was, you looked up and you saw angels flying all over the top. And you saw gold, you saw blue, you saw red, you saw purple. So this causes us to ask, well, what do those colors mean? And I've often wondered why God did not tell us in Exodus 25 through 31, here's what red means, here's what blue means, here's what purple means. You don't find explanations there in those chapters. And so we have to go to the rest of the Bible and find where it uses the color red and blue and purple. But just recently, in fact, just this last year, one of my colleagues finished writing his doctoral dissertation on the on the symbolism of the sanctuary against the background of Egypt. In other words, what did those colors mean to an Egyptian? And he was, he was excited to find that in Egypt, they all knew what those colors represented. And the children of Israel that had lived there for hundreds of years, if you showed them the color red, they would tell you, oh, of course, I know what that means. And you showed them blue, I know what that means. And purple, I know what that means. White, I know what that means. Gold, I know what that means. So God didn't need to tell them. He just needed to add something to what the Egyptians understood. God needed to add a special uh, focus upon himself and upon the sacrifices. And so here's what uh, my friend uh, found the, symbol, the colors mean in Egypt. The color blue stands for cosmic divinity. You look up at the sky where God lives and it's this royal blue. And you look at God's throne in Ezekiel and it's, 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 its color is, is a blue, sapphire, or probably lapis lazuli was the actual stone, this deep blue. And so blue is representing God, divinity. And red in Egyptian culture meant supernatural protection. Well, the red of the sanctuary also meant supernatural protection, but it wasn't by some of the Egyptian gods. It was protection because of the blood of the lamb that provided redemption for them. So supernatural protection through 
the blood. And then purple, just as in the Bible in Egypt, it meant royalty. Only royal people wore purple. And white, just as in the Bible, meant purity. And gold was only associated with the gods. Only the, only the gods and their temples were built with gold. So we see this first curtain, and it has all four of that, blue, red, purple, and white and gold. It has all, all of those things, all five of those things. And uh, there's a, this is fascinating that we found one king in the history of Egypt whose tomb was not looted. His name was King Tut. And when they opened King Tut's tomb, and I've been down there and gone into King Tut's tomb and gone to the museum and seen all the things that they found, they found the face mask and they found all of his jewelry and they found all of the, the decorations in, in his tomb that never got robbed like all the other tombs. And guess what color they all are? A mixture of red and blue and purple and gold and white. The king who was a god in Egypt was represented by those four colors. And God takes those four colors and says, look, the real king is me. And so I'm going to decorate my ceiling with these colors and I'm going to put cherubim in there. So what's the next, uh, after the inner liner, the next one is goat's hair. Now it's not black goats. There were some black goats, but these were probably the off-white goats. And so there was a color, that second layer representing the, the beautiful purity of Jesus, his holiness and his purity. And then there was, the next layer was ram skin. And it was dyed a special color. It was dyed red. And this takes us back to Mount Moriah, where that ram died in place of Isaac so that Isaac didn't have to die. And so it teaches us that the ram stands for Jesus, who was to come to die for us. And it's colored red. It's dyed red to remind us of his blood. And so we have that beautiful picture. Now, the most surprising one, and this is the first time I've ever shared this with a Pathfinder. I've only shared it with a, a, a group of my students a couple of times. I've been writing a commentary on the book of Exodus, and I've been trying to research these different uh, colors and, and these different textures. And this last one is called badger skin. Now you see this, this painting we have in front of us has the brown, which would probably be the color of a badger. And that is a possibility. But uh, there are other suggestions that it's a seal skin, kind of a black skin. Others are suggested maybe it's a goat skin. It's a, it's a rare Hebrew word that's only used here. We don't, for a long time, scholars didn't know what it meant. But recently, they found that this is actually a loan word. It's not an Israelite word. It's an Egyptian word. And it refers to a special kind of leather that is very soft and the most fine quality leather that you can possibly make. And in Egypt, the favorite color that they used to dye that fine leather was blue. And so the Greek translation of this word in the time of, even before the time of Jesus, it says that that outer layer was a blue leather skin. And so I'd like to suggest that probably the color was a deep blue. Now, if I can just show the color, it actually, the Septuagint uses a word, it uses the word hyacinth for the color of blue. So I, I have a picture here of a hyacinth, and let me see if I can find this hyacinth. Um, I have to exit full screen. And I hope I can find my hyacinth picker here. Can you see that? Do you see a picture of hyacinth? Not yet. You have to hit share screen from your end. Okay, I did. Zoom. I did, but it's not working. Uh, uh, hmm. Okay, let's see. I may have needed to have done that beforehand. So. Anyway, you can imagine, I'm not going to try to show pictures because I'll probably mess it up. You've got all the main pictures. So imagine outside my yard, there is in the woods growing a big pile of, a, a big field of hyacinths, beautiful hyacinths. And um, I, I, I failed to put it on my, uh, put it on my uh, screen. So 
that's going to have to. We we can always post it later with the video. Yeah, we'll 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 post it later. So now I close this, and I should I should be back here now. Okay, as you know, I haven't been on doing Zoom very long, so I'm so glad I've got technical personnel to watch to to match it. So, I. I'm, I'm convinced that uh, the color God loves, his throne is made out of this deep royal blue. And so what would be more fitting for the house of a king to have his roof even made with this royal blue? And Flavius Josephus, back in the time of Jesus, describes the color of the sanctuary as the color of the sky, the color of the roof as the color of the sky, which would be blue. So... Um, so we can we can know what all of these mean. We've gone through the meaning of each of these, um, and so now let's let's go back and let's look at each one of the articles of furniture, Dr. Campbell. Let's take right. our tour inside now. There we go. Let me just move along. There we okay. go. All right, so we've looked at the altar of burnt offering, and now we come to the altar of incense. And here is, we are in now what we call the holy place. And in the holy place, you have these three articles of furniture. You have the incense, and you have a lampstand, and you have a table of showbread. Let's talk about the incense first. Uh, just as there's an altar out in the courtyard where the animals were sacrificed and the blood stands for Jesus' blood, so here inside the holy place is this altar of incense. And the incense stands for Jesus' merits, for his righteousness, for his wonderful, perfect character that he places instead of ours, because our characters are not perfect. We're always messing up and we have a sinful nature and our, our works are never good enough that can, that can uh, allow us to be accepted based upon our works. And so this incense rises with our prayers and Jesus as our mediator in heaven, as our high priest, he accepts our prayers through the incense of his righteousness and he smells, and what he smells is not our stench, but he smells the beauty of the incense that is rising, the beauty of his own righteousness, which is it comes acceptable before God. Uh, now, if you could just uh, uh, close that for just a second, I've got actually the ingredients here for the incense. And unfortunately, they haven't yet invented Zoom that you can actually smell. Because <laughs> here, here is the first ingredient, frankincense. It has a wonderful smell. Sorry, I can't pass it on. Here is the second ingredient, which is galbanium. And it again has a wonderful pungent smell. And then this one is Styrex, yet another wonder, wonderful one. And then the fourth one is Ankia, or Anka, sorry, Anka. And these are rare spices that are collected from various uh, places around the world that the spice merchants would be bringing through the Mount Sinai area and they could have bought these very costly spices. I open these up and take uh, pass them around the room so that my students can smell them and the whole room is just filled with this fragrant perfume. And Ellen White writes that this perfume was so pungent that you could smell it for miles around. Mm. And so God is a lover of beauty not only in beauty and the way he makes this gorgeous covering and these beautiful articles of furniture, but also the beauty of smell. Mm. God is a lover of uh, smell beauty and the taste beauty as well as sight beauty and hearing beauty. Okay, so now let's, so that's the, um, that's the altar of incense. Let's go, what do you have, which one do you have next for us? All right, next up is... Ah, the lampstand, okay. So the lampstand, the lampstand was made out of pure gold. One talent of pure gold. That is 75 pounds of gold. 
I, I imagine some of you pathfinders probably weigh about 75 pounds. Imagine the weight of your whole body made out of gold. Mm. And you notice it's uh, very finely decorated. And this, it was probably even more ornately decorated than this picture. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Campbell, I have my own picture here of a, of a lampstand. So let me hold it up. Here's my lampstand. This is the shape of what the lampstand looked like in the days of Jesus. The lampstand in the temple. This is called the Temple Menorah. And when the temple was destroyed, Titus took this menorah and brought it back to Rome. And so if you go and visit Rome, you find over this arch called Titus's arch, you find the picture of this menorah that was actually in the temple. And you notice it is shaped like, if you look very closely, it has buds and blossoms from the almond tree. The almond tree, if any of you live near where you have almond trees, you go out in the early spring and the first tree to bloom, to bloom to life, is the almond tree. And it's called the awakener tree. And so God chose this the shape of this tree, which is the symbol of life, of abundant life, to say, that's what I want you to see when you see the lampstand, that I am the light of the world, and as John 1 says, and the light is giving life to those who accept the light. So Jesus, the light of the world, and the oil that was used in the lampstand, pure extra virgin olive oil that represented the Holy Spirit, Zechariah chapter 4. The, the Holy Spirit is the oil that is burning forth from, these, from this uh, seven-branched candelabra or lampstand. Okay, so what is the next one? All right, coming back. There we go. Okay, so we have the table of showbread. Uh, or it's basically another good translation is the table of the presence because this table represented along with the ark in the holy place, the very presence of God. Here's the presence of God in the holy place. Uh, some scholars say that these two uh, uh, piles of the bread of the presence may actually represent the, uh, the father and the son and and then the Holy Spirit is the, the light, the, the, uh, the oil on the other side of the room. And so this one is on the north side. The lampstand was on the south. And the incense is on the west as close as possible to the most holy place. Can you count the number of loaves of bread? If you counted 12, you count right. That stood for the 12 the twelve tribes of Israel. There was one loaf for every tribe in the, uh, in the camp of Israel. And it was changed every Sabbath. And the priests and their family would get to eat the special holy bread. So if you belong to one of the priests' family, you got to eat of this special bread every or Sabbath dinner, or maybe even Sabbath breakfast. And of course, Jesus says very clearly, I am the bread of life. But this is a table, and it's got bread on it. And you can see it also has a, a pitcher for grape juice. And so it was ultimately standing for the place in God's house where you have the dining room, where you have the dining table. It's telling the children of Israel, I wish there were room here in this house for you to come and sit around the table with me. So I'll just have 12 loaves to represent all of you. And the priest will come and he will eat it and he will represent you. But I want you to imagine that this is my house. And this is telling you that I want to have special fellowship with you. I love to sit together and have a great meal together. And someday soon, he's saying, there's going to be a big table made out of silver, miles long, Ellen White describes. She saw it in vision. It's going to be piled with manna and piled with bread and piled with the fruit from the tree of life and uh, all kinds of other uh, great food. And then Jesus himself, our humble Savior, is going to serve us. 
and our eyes will be so good we'll be able to look from one end of the table miles down and see our our Pathfinder friend that's sit, seated at the table maybe five miles down and we'll be able to recognize him. It's gonna be a great day. And so this table of showbread shows us Jesus, the bread of life to provide food for us and to provide fellowship because Jesus loves to camp. And I don't know about you, one of the best times for camping to me is when I can come home after a hard day's hike and there's a wonderful meal pancakes imagine those as six pancakes piled up and you can uh just see how god the camper wants to have pancakes there on his uh, table of showbread if you want to picture it as a uh, as a camping scene that's okay um think of it this way i like to think of it this way these three articles of furniture let's review what are they Show, table of showbread altar of incense and the lampstand Oh, by the way, I have one more lampstand. I wanted to show you my big lampstand. If you could just let me have one more chance here. This is my favorite one. Here, Joanne and I purchased this some time ago. I can't even get it all in the picture, but we have this down in our living room. It uh, sits there and reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. And uh, it's also a reminder that we will one day be able to go to God's house and we will sit in his living room perhaps and here will be this big chandelier that uh, even after the sin problem is solved, we'll still need the lampstand to give light to us as he's sharing his truth and he's sharing his, his, uh, his insights. We can tell camping stories around the living room of God in his sanctuary, his heavenly home. But think of it this way, the courtyard actually can represent our Christian walk. When you go camping, when you go hiking, especially when you get up early in the morning, and I usually, I like to climb those 14ers up there in Colorado, where you have to get up at three o'clock in the morning in order to be able to make it up and back down. And so you, first of all, you need light. You need light to know where to go. And so God gives us the light to show us where to go in our Christian walk with him. And then you need bread. You need bread to give strength to go on that, that backpacking hike with God. And then prayer is like uh, communication. We get to talk to God back and forth as we're hiking. Uh, I don't like to hike alone. I like to hike with someone so I can talk. I can talk to God. And he says, these three things you really need when you go camping with me. You need the light, you need the bread, you need, we need to talk together. Isn't that pretty? Isn't that beautiful? So there's a picture of the, the holy place. Now we need to go into the most holy place. It's the shape of a cube. And inside the holy place is this one article of furniture, the, the ark, the sacred ark made out of solid gold. And there's a difference of opinion on exactly what the ark stands for. Uh, some say it is the throne of God, but there are some passages in the Bible that lead to a different conclusion that actually this is God's footstool. I don't know if you've ever sat in a big chair and you just like to put your feet up on a, on a footstool and just relax. And the thrones in the time of Moses, there were these big, beautiful golden thrones or, or uh, time of Solomon, what have you. They had these wonderful thrones. And then the king would always have a footstool. And in his footstool, he ha would have a lid on the footstool and the footstool would be opened and inside was a document made out of stone often, or sometimes out of clay. And it was a covenant. It was an agreement between the king and the other nations that served him, that worshiped him. And this was the agreement that they would, that they would go by, that they would follow. They would, this would be his guidelines for the people that worshiped him, that served him. And so God is doing the same thing. Inside of this ark, there were the 10 words. Now, some people translate it 10 commandments, but the, the Hebrew doesn't actually say commandments. It says 10 words. 
And I like how Ellen White describes it. She says they're not, they're not so much commandments as they are promises. She says there are 10 promises. God is saying, here's the way that you can have happiness in life. Here are 10 guidelines that I want to give you power to be able to do. And in the very first part of Exodus 20, he says, I'm the Lord your God who has brought you out of the house of bondage. I've already saved you. This, you don't need to keep these commandments to be saved. You're already saved by my blood, by my righteousness. But now I want you to live a happy life. I want us to have this fellowship, this intimate oneness as father and son, father and daughter together. So here are 10 promises I give you of how you can find this wonderful life. And so God gives us this covenant, makes this covenant with us, and he places it right there underneath his throne, right in the footstool. So it will be always reminding him that uh, he is keeping his covenant with his people. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that uh, there would be kings in the Old Testament times that would make covenants with other nations that they conquered. But all the false gods around Israel, none of those supposed gods would ever make a covenant with a people. Jehovah God, this God, was the one God who said, you can trust my word. I'm going to make a covenant. Here's the promises I'm going to make you, and you can trust me. And just to know for sure, I'm going to put them right under my throne so I, you will be able to, to, to know them. So now back to the picture, bring the picture back. And we see that if this is the footstool, then you've got these two cherubim, these two angels with their wings spread over. And right between their wings is where the Shekinah glory came. That's where this great halo of light, the very presence of the Almighty God came and down and dwelt with his people. And these angels were covering their faces as they were, as they were there representing all the angelic host that was surrounding uh, the throne of God. And so it was an invisible throne, and God was enthroned above the cherubim. And we have his footstool here with the ark. And there in the ark, of course, we also have other things. We have the, the manna that uh, God provided Israel with and the, the Aaron's rod that budded, and we could talk more about that. But I do want to mention the cover of the ark, made out of solid gold, this mercy seat, this atonement cover, it's sometimes called. Because above it is God's throne, is his, his holy presence. And we are sinners. So how can we face a holy God? And how can we live up to the law ourselves? We can't. And so what does God do? He puts this atonement lid on top of the ark that stands for Jesus' righteousness, Jesus' grace that comes between us and the law and God so that Jesus stands for us there. And we can, we can be saved not in our own righteousness, but because he is the mercy seat that has given his life in our stead so that we can have his righteousness. It teaches the gospel right there. Okay, so now we've gone through the different pieces of the, of the articles of furniture. And if you want to summarize them, I would summarize them this way. These are really the three stages of the Christian life. In the courtyard is where Jesus died on Calvary and where he died for our sins and where we accept him as our savior. And we're born again and we're cleansed at the fountain and we start the Christian walk. We call that justification. That's a big word, but you can break it down. It just means just as if I've never sinned. Jesus accepts us as his children and he wipes away our sins and we are accepted in Jesus' blood. That's the start of the Christian walk, the holy place. And every day we go and we, again, accept him as our savior each day of our lives. But then he says, I don't want to just remove the guilt of your sin. 
I want to also help you to get rid of the power of sin in your life. And so we go into the sanctuary, and there we find power. We find at the table of showbread, we find his word that we can eat as the bread of life and gives us spiritual strength. And we go over and we find the Holy Spirit that provides us power to live the, the life of victory. And there we go to the altar of incense, and there Jesus as our mediator, he is offering up our prayers and, and making them acceptable before God. He is accepting our forgiveness cries when we say, Lord, forgive us when we sin. And Jesus is covering us as our, as our wonderful high priest. And so the holy place is where God is removing the very power of sin so we can live the abundant life as his children. But one day soon, he is going to be He's going to be living, uh, we're going to be living in his very presence, and he's going to take away the very presence of sin, and we call that glorification. So there's justification, just as if I've never sinned, sanctification, making us more like him, and then glorification. That's the symbol that we, symbols that we have. All right, so now we have... Uh, Quick question, Dr. Davidson. Yes, uh, go for it. One, um, I've had a couple people ask, we'll try to come back to some of the questions at the end, but which direction was the sanctuary facing? Yes, it faced toward the east. So as you, as you come into the door of the sanctuary, you're coming from the east and you're going in toward the west. So when you draw your sanctuary, try to draw it that way. Try to make the right-hand part of your paper the entrance to the sanctuary. And then when you go left, go in, you're going in toward the west. And so Pathfinders, I just want to do a quick reminder while, uh, before we transition on. A few of you joined a little bit late. If you're missing the worksheet or having some questions or issues, just message my wife, Heidi Campbell. She's in the chat thing. You can just send her a private message. She'll help you get the worksheet or whatever else. And we'll come back to some of the other questions at the end. Uh, and so I just did a little quick poll. So if some of you wanna vote still, you still can. We've got most of you that have voted. I put a little uh, poll here. What object of the sanctuary have you enjoyed learning about the most so far? And so let me go ahead and uh, launch the results. It's kind of fun. It's a fun way to, to kind of make it interactive together. And by far, 58% uh, of you said the Ark of the Covenant, which is cool. I, I hmm. enjoy learning about that. That's where God's presence was and everything else. But there's a whole smattering of others. The altar of sacrifice comes in with 12%. And then we've got the table of showbread, uh, the altar of incense, and then uh, the laver, the, the washing, and the lampstand. Now, there was one other quick question, Dr. Davidson. Someone, you mentioned the lampstand, 75 pounds of gold. Someone was wondering about the table of showbread. Do you have any idea how much gold it took for that by chance? Uh, we don't know the exact amount for each article of furniture, but we know that there was over one ton of gold that was used in making the articles of furniture and all of the objects that were made out of gold in the sanctuary, over a ton of gold. And four tons of silver four tons of silver. And if you want to extend that to the temple, I mean, you, first of all, camping. Can you imagine going camping and putting a ton of gold in your backpack? <laughs> but the campers, all of those campers, they had to carry, uh, they had to carry the, they had to carry a ton of gold around and, and four tons of, four tons of silver around for 40 years as they wandered. And then when you got to the temple, the temple had, uh, one uh, 100,000 talents of gold, which was 3,500 tons of gold in the temple. Wow. And one million talents of silver, which was 35,000 tons of silver. That is an awful lot of gold and silver. Many countries don't even have that much gold and silver in their country. That's how, that's how splendid. Ellen White writes that the temple was the most beautiful building that ever existed in this earth. 
And God intended for that temple in Jerusalem to have lasted forever. If God's people had been faithful, we would still be worshiping in that Jerusalem temple today. So yeah, it was very lavishly displayed because God is a God of beauty. And the king of the universe deserves the best. And he wanted them to realize he was their king and he was providing for all of their needs. All right, let's move on. I love it. Okay, so I, I, we're at question number five. Why did the Israelites need a sanctuary? We've partially answered this. We read Exodus 25 and verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may, what? Dwell. Dwell among them. So they needed it because they needed God. They needed God to camp with them. I have gone camping a few times without a good guide, and it hasn't turned out well. I won't tell those terrible stories. So I always go with someone that knows the route or we have a good map or something, and God says, look, I'm going to be your guide through the wilderness. I'm going to be your shepherd through the wilderness, and I am going to be there right camping right in the middle, right with you. And so that's, that's reason number one, so God could be close to them. And also, because they were sinners, and a sinful person can't dwell close to a, a holy God without terrible things happening, simply because uh, it's like us trying to get close to the sun. We, we, we burn up like toast. And unless God has given us cleansing and purity so that we can stand the heat and the light, we're not going to be able to get very close to him. And so the sanctuary was the place to solve the sin problem, to get rid of the obstacles, to get rid of the things that would stand in the way between us and God. And that was uh, the way of the sacrificial system to uh, cleanse for, from the sins. And then um, also, of course, it was to point us to what Jesus is doing right now, because this is not just pretend. This isn't just a sandbox. There's a real heavenly sanctuary right now, and Jesus is there. He's there working for us to do everything he can so that we can live the abundant life and we can spend eternity with him. And so this earthly sanctuary gives us a, a little glimpse to see what he's doing in heaven. This is like the shadow that's pointing to the reality in heaven. Okay? Um, and then that connected with that is a question number six. What do the sanctuary and Jesus' birth and ministry and second coming all have in common? Common. So the sanctuary, Jesus' incarnation, his birth, and uh, his um, ministry, and then his second coming. What do they have in common? Well, for me, and there may be different answers to this, but what they all have in common, common is God wants to be close to us. Uh, the sanctuary was so that I may dwell among you. And when Jesus came, John 1, 14 says, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Uh, literally, he became a tent. He became like the tabernacle. He was the, the antitypical tabernacle, the fulfillment of everything that the tabernacle stood for. And he did that so he could come close to us. He tabernacled among us. And when Jesus comes again, he comes to take us. He says, I'm in my father's house are many rooms. Now, we usually think of that as heaven. or Oh, but the father's house, the house of the Lord in the Bible is the technical term for the heavenly sanctuary. In my heavenly sanctuary are many rooms. And I'm coming to get you, to come and bring you to live in one of those rooms. So for eternity, we're going to get to live in one of the rooms, just like the priests did around the temple. They all had a city home, right, connected with the temple. We'll have a room right in the, in the Holy of Holies, right around the Holy of Holies for eternity. We'll also have our country home, and maybe Michael will go back to Canada, maybe, or stay in Texas, I don't know. You know I'm gonna head where there's mountains. Uh, I, have to, I have to go a thousand miles. To the nearest mountain from where I, where I am here in Michigan. I go out to, and, to ask you, have you really climbed all the 14ers in Colorado? I have, all okay. 48, yes. All right. <laughs> no, there's, 50, there's 54 of them, and then there's five more that are, that are 
above 14,000 feet, but they don't have a distant, far enough distance apart to count as separate mountains. And so I've done them all. I've done all 58. Yeah. So, cool. so I love the mountains. Right. And I'm thankful that the sanctuary is going to be on Mount Zion. That's going to be the best mountain of all. And the sanctuary was first built right at the foot of Mount Sinai. So, okay. Well, let's get to our questions. Now, number seven, what role did the sanctuary play in the forgiveness of sin? Well, let's just visualize it. If we committed a sin and we have that picture, maybe, I don't know if you can put up that picture, that very first picture again. Yeah, come into it. Oops, where did it go? Just a moment. Go ahead and talk about it and I'll have it up in a second. Okay. So we come and we confess our sins and we come with our sin offering, with our animal, and we lay our hands. I don't think you don't have a picture of someone, uh, a sacrifice on the sanctuary, do you, on the altar? Do you have one like that? Uh, let me try to get that, get that first picture up and I will find one here in just a second. Here we go. Go. I'll get a sacrifice in just a second. All right, Why are you trying to first okay, one? Okay, get a yeah, there we are. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you see in this picture, you see the worshiper right outside of the courtyard, just ready to go into the courtyard with the animal. He's bringing his sacrifice. And you see over to the right, you see a priest and there is a sinner that is kneeling with his hands that are, that are uh, touching or, or uh, laying his hands on the head of the innocent animal. And implicitly, he's, he's confessing his sins over that animal. And then by laying on his hands, the sins are, are in symbol transferred to that innocent animal. And then the sinner kills the animal and the priest collects the blood and is carried uh, to either, uh, he either carries the blood into the sanctuary and, and sprinkles it on the, uh, on the horns of the altar of incense. Yeah, there we have it. Or, and so that, and then the animal is sacrificed. He is, uh, the animal is burned on the, on the altar. Um, and sometimes the priest would take a little bit of the sacrifice and would eat it himself. So here we have a picture of the, the man. Uh, well, yeah, you see a number of pictures here of the sacrificial system and the laying of the hand on the sacrificial animal. That's good. All right. Uh, and then the sacrifice is burned and the blood is poured out on the horn or a t daubed to the altar and bl blood is poured out under the altar. And what happens? What is happening here? The sinner is having the sins take off, taken away from him and put on to the animal. And then the animal, representing Jesus, dies in his place. So he doesn't have to die for that sin because Jesus dies for that sin. And there, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is, is uh, on the altar. And he is dying for us, paying the price which we deserve. The fire represents... God's justice coming and giving the punishment of sin and Jesus who didn't deserve any of that. We should have all been there on the altar. Instead, we go free and Jesus takes that punishment that we all deserve. And so we are cleansed, but there, there still needs to be a record of those sins because God wants to make sure that we don't want to change our minds. He's not going to force us to continue to serve him if we don't want to. And so he takes the blood that goes into the sanctuary is the record. It's carrying the record of our sins, and that gets stored up there in the sanctuary. So that's what happened. Every time someone sinned, they would come and they would bring the lamb, and that lamb would die in their place, and then the blood would go into the sanctuary to wait for the Day of Atonement when uh, the final, uh, it would finally be taken care of for the last time. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But let's go to number eight, the priests in the sanctuary. 
This is kind of a trick question. What tribe did the priests belong to? Now I can hear everyone shouting. Everyone knows that. Tribe of Levi. Well, yes, but when? The, God's original plan at Mount Sinai was that all of us would be priests. In Exodus 19, he says, you are a nation of priests, a priesthood of all believers. That would mean men, women, children, boys, girls, just like when we get to heaven, we're all going to be priests again. And just like as now in the church, we don't have any priest in the church. We just have the, Jesus as the high priest, but we're all priests. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, he says, you're all priests. We're, everyone that believes in Jesus is, is part of this, this everlasting and uh, universal priesthood. That was his plan. And uh, the firstborn of each of the families would, uh, would act as the one who would go and represent their family uh, doing service there at the sanctuary. But unfortunately, you remember when Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days down below, the children of Israel got impatient because he didn't come down. And so they started worshiping the golden calf. And so then when Moses came down, he called everyone who was faithful to him to come to his side and all the tribe of Levi. None of them had participated in that idolatrous worship. And so all of them became the line that was the, the, the tribe that uh, the, the family from the tribe of Levi, the Levites from the tribe of Levi, all the families were ministers in the sanctuary in some, kind, some way. Some of the Levites took care of the music. Some of the Levites took care of caring for the different articles of furniture and uh, the women uh, served around the around the sanctuary as well as described. So it was uh, then narrowed down to just the tribe of Levi. Well, how about the priests themselves? Well, that was just one family of the tribe of Levi, and that was Aaron. Aaron became the first high priest, the brother of Moses. Isn't this ironic? Isn't this amazing? Aaron was the one that allowed the golden calf hypostasy to go on and even lied about it when Moses came down and Moses said, what have you done? He says, well, I just threw in this gold in there and out came this calf. I don't know how that happened. But he was sorry. He truly forgave. He truly asked for forgiveness. And that shows God's grace. I don't care how, how many bad things we've done. I don't care how far we've gone in messing up. God says, if, if, if you ask for forgiveness, I'm going to treat you just like you've never sinned. And no one died there that day that repented. It was only those people that refused to repent. But Aaron, who was even the one letting it all happen while Moses was gone, he becomes the high priest, the worst sinner, if you might please. The one who was the ringleader becomes God's most holy servant, the only one that could go into the Holy of Holies. That shows God's grace to me. And so Moses... Uh, Brother Aaron became the high priest, and his children, his sons, became priests. And that family of Aaron continued on to be the priestly family. When Aaron died, then his oldest son became high priest, and on down to the time of Jesus. So what did a priest do? Let's go to uh, question uh, number uh, 8C. What did a priest do? Well, a priest was a teacher. I like to use that first because I like the fact of being able to teach. I don't like the idea of, I don't know that I could have been a priest in the Old Testament time. I've never tasted meat, let alone have to offer sacrifices. I can't even kill a mouse, let alone an, a, 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 a lamb. Uh, and I don't think God enjoyed watching the death of animals either. The first, uh, the first death that Adam saw was horrible and Adam had never seen death. And God, God had to tell Adam, I don't, I'm weeping with you, but I've got to find a way before Jesus comes to show you how horrible sin is. Every time you sin, it's like, it's like killing Jesus. And so I don't want you to ever sin. And if you sin, I want you to know you have a savior. So he gives them the sacrificial system, but I'm thankful we live on this end 
on this side of Calvary where we don't have to offer those sacrifices because Jesus had. But the priest did the sacrifices. He helped out with the sacrifices, the various sacrifices. And he also did teaching. He was a judge. If they had a specific hard case, they would. he was like the Supreme Court justice. The judges would be the priests. And he also, uh, every day, would go in. He would tend the sanctuary. So every Sabbath, he'd change the bread. He would go and he would trim the lamps of the lampstand. He would go in in the morning and he would make put new incense there and start burning the new incense. All the things that happened every day. This was the work of the priests. And most importantly of all, he bore on his shoulders the, the sins of the people. He had those two stones on his shoulders made out of onyx. And over his heart, he had those 12 um, stones, the precious stones, one standing for each one of the 12 tribes. And so he really bore their sins on his self, just like Jesus bears our sins. So this high priest was representing that. Uh, but on the Day of Atonement, there was a special job that he did. He had this special goat, the Lord's goat. And the Lord's goat was sacrificed, and then he took the blood of the Lord's goat into the sanctuary. But this time, there were no hands laid on this animal. So there was no sin transferred to the animal. So the animal went in with blood without any sin on it. So the blood that went in on the Day of Atonement was not blood to defile the sanctuary, to make it dirty, but it was, it was blood to clean it. And so the, the blood, the sin-free blood went in, and then in symbol, it brought out all the sins that had accumulated over the year. And God was making an end to the record of sins. And it represented the judgment, the investigative judgment, where Jesus is right now going through the records and affirming who are his, who, who have decided still to keep on following him. And this judgment is going on. It's good news. Jesus is on our side. God is on our side. And it's the process of uh, the universe shouting hallelujah and amen for every child of God who was affirmed as his child. And it's also the time when Satan's charges, Satan the great liar, is accusing us all that we have no right in heaven. God shows us, shows our records to the universe. The judgment is not for God. He knows who are his, but Satan has been accusing everyone. And so God shows all the record of his people. And then he says, yeah, Davidson, Dr. Davidson did all of that. But look closer, Satan, and beside every one of those sins, you have pardoned, forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. And so the picture that we have of this Day of Atonement is of God, the great, mighty Savior and Judge. We look into our Judge's face and we see a Savior there that is wanting to save us. And those sins are then brought out and finally put on Satan, the scapegoat, and sent out into a wilderness. Satan's not bearing our sins. He's the garbage truck. And all of the, the junk sins, the junk stuff is put on him, and he goes out. And that stands for the millennium during the thousand years when Satan has had to think about all the things he caused us to do. And then finally, Satan, his, he comes to an end. Sin comes to an end. The earth is fire, cleanses the earth, and we start the new earth that sin is going to never rise again. It's a beautiful picture that we've got of the Day of Atonement. Now we've, uh, I think we've got just, um, yeah, two more questions. And that is, um, what clothes did the priest wear? So maybe we could get up the clothing of the priest. First, the regular priest. Just a minute. Let's go down. There we go. Okay, well there's let's see. Do you have a do you have a picture there? No, okay, that's well, let's just leave this one up. This is okay. So this is the high priest, but uh ever all the priests wore linen garments. They had uh, the linen uh underclothes, their undergarments, their trousers. And then they had this long-sleeved white robe made out of linen. And then they had a sash uh, that was uh, embroidered with needlework tied about the chest. 
uh, and then they had the headband. All the priests wore that. But then beside those white linen garments, the high priest, you can see, he wore that seamless robe, all of blue, that uh, hanging down just below the knees. And uh, then there was that um, uh, uh, ephod, the two-piece ephod, the shape of an apron that stops above the knees, made of the same material as the veil, the blue and the purple and the scarlet. And then there was a waistband around the ephod to secure that, made out of the same material. And then there was the breastplate of judgment that had on the uh, uh, 12 jewels with the names of the 12 tribes. And it also had the urim and the thrum thummim, those two stones that would light up one for yes and the other for uh, would be a dark if it was to be a no if they asked God a question. And then finally that linen uh, headband with a plaque of gold right above his forehead, right on his forehead saying, holiness to the Lord. Now I've been collecting, um, I've been collecting the jewels of the high priest and I'm gonna hope that I can get that up. I, so can I just share the screen here and let's see if I can get that? Yes, now let's see if this shows. Does that show? Yes. All right. Good. So. I've been working on this for a long time, and uh, these are, I'm not gonna go through each one because our time is racing, but I just wanted to show you that uh, these are, as far as we can best determine, these are the, the various uh, uh, stones that represent the, the jewels of the high priest. And uh, I've tried to get big, big pieces. For example, I will pull here this the the one the green one is this big see it's uh, fills my whole hand that's not how big it was on his chest but i wanted to get a nice size so you get a feel of what it was and you see the you see the one in the middle the blue one that really beautiful blue one i forgot to mention when we were talking about the ark but if you could just uh, re, uh, close this one now michael and let me just show this full screen with this. And that middle one is called the lapis lazuli stone, lapis lazuli. And uh, I guess you can, oh, I guess I have it, don't I? I've got to close it. Yeah, you it. have to close it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just well, sure, can I can you. close it. Here we go. There it is. So this stone is lapis lazuli. My wife saw this in a, in a rare uh, gem shop and she said, you've got to have this. You talk about the sanctuary, so you've got to have this. This lapis lazuli in most Bible translations is translated as uh, sapphire, but it's probably not sapphire because sapphire, they didn't have sapphire that were used as precious gems in the time of Moses. This is a, uh, this, this comes as layers and it's in Afghanistan and in Moses time, it was out in the wilderness of Judea. You see these flat layers and it has blue flecks of gold. It's not real gold, but a uh, gold, gold color that is in it. And why this is so special to me is that when Moses went up on the mountain and God showed him a little, little glimpse of the heavenly sanctuary, it says that he saw a, save, a pavement of, of lapis lazuli, which was probably a, a little part of the pavement of the heavenly sanctuary. And then a couple verses later, God says, now I want you to, I'm going to, I'm going to cut two stone, two tablets of the stone. The stone. Well, what stone has been mentioned? The only stone that's been mentioned is the lapis lazuli. And so very likely, and our rabbis usually agree with this, very likely the Ten Commandments were made out of this beautiful lapis lazuli stone. Can you imagine wow. God writing with his own finger the law on this beautiful lapis lazuli and a stone maybe uh, 10 or 15, 15 inches wide and maybe a couple feet high that he is writing the 10 words on? 
And then when Moses comes down, he breaks the first one, and God says, I want you to make another pair. And, and fortunately, right near where the Israelites camped in Mount Sinai, there was a lapis lazuli mine where they could get more lapis lazuli. So Moses could make another couple of sets of the lapis lazuli stone. So each one of these stones, including the lapis lazuli, represented one tribe. And Ellen White said that each one of the stones actually has these, the, a special light that represents that tribe. They're various different colors and different shapes and a different uh, a glint. Uh, some are brighter than others. And uh, you remember that when we enter into the New Jerusalem, we're going to enter in through one of the gates, and each gate is going to have one of the different uh, the the one of the different stones is going to be at each gate, and so uh, these stones really represent all of us, and we will see them again in the uh, New Jerusalem. Um, now, the difference, the number nine. Uh, the difference between the regular offerings and the annual Day of Atonement. We've we've basically covered this already. During the year. The people would bring their sin offerings. They would also do other offerings like the burnt offering and the grain offering for Thanksgiving and the, the peace offering when God had done something special for them in their spiritual life and they wanted to just thank you, God, for giving these peace. They would offer up these offerings, these free will offerings. And then there were the sin offerings for when they, when they, they fell into sin. Those were done during the year. But then in the final, at the end of the year, was this Day of Atonement that we've already described that was um, the, actually during the Day of Atonement, there were 49 different offerings that were made, but the main one that was different was this Lord's goat that we have described here. So I'm gonna see if I have one more picture that I hope I put on the screen. If I didn't, probably didn't. Not yet, just hit the share screen again. Yeah. Can you see the hyacinth now? Yes. There's the hyacinth. I tried to find it before. That's the blue that was probably the color on the outside of the, on the art side of the uh, sanctuary. But I had a picture, I, I may find this, but uh, uh, that someone in my class a couple semesters ago drew. Let's see if I can, let's see if I can put it up. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, I'm not finding it, it's okay. I'll just describe it. It's a cartoon and maybe we can send this out, Michael, when we send out our news, news I'll, I'll send you a, uh, a picture of this so people can get an idea of what the judgment is. Because Adventists especially appreciate the sanctuary message because it's a message of a judgment that's going on in heaven above. And a lot of times I talk to people that are afraid, man, my name's gonna come up in the judgment and I'm not gonna be ready. That's what was my experience. And I've come to learn that the judgment is not something that, that we have to be afraid of. Even, even though we're great sinners, God is only one prayer away, just a prayer of, Lord, please forgive me. I reach out and I accept you as my savior. And he wipes all those sins away. And he accepts us just as if we've never sinned. And so in the judgment, when Satan says and mentions your name and when that your name should come up, and by the way, our name is not just gonna come up any old time. It's gonna be when everyone has decided for and against Christ. Now, of course, I could die tonight. And the next thing that would happen would be the judgment. But God's going to wait until everyone in this earth that's alive will have decided for him or against him. The wicked will be all the way against him and the righteous will be all the way for him. And then he will say, here are my people. And all of those who are on his side, he will, he will uh, very quickly uh, un, uh, affirm them in the judgment and the universe will cry out, Hosanna, save them now. And Satan, who will be trying desperately to accuse us, his mouth will be stopped and he'll be, he won't be able to say anything. Meanwhile, in that judgment, we won't need to be afraid because Jesus is our high priest and he's never lost a case that has been 
that has been brought before him. And so we can be jumping for joy in the judgment. And the picture I'm going to show you is a picture a student drew with Satan there with his glum look, I'm going to get you. And Jesus is there with a big smile on his face, and he has this big record of all of my sins. And next to him is pardon, pardon, pardon by the blood of the Lamb. And then over here on the other side, you can see me, Dr. Davidson, <laughs> jumping up in the air, shouting, hallelujah, because the judgment is good news. And so, Pathfinder friends, the, the sanctuary is powerful news for campers. Because we get to camp with Jesus and see everywhere we look, Jesus described in every part of the sanctuary. And he gets to travel with us wherever we're camping through life. And then uh, the special part of the judgment scene is where it's all going to wind up. And that, the next thing we know, we're going to be in the heavenly sanctuary. He's going to come and get us. And we're going to get to spend eternity in the very presence of God. Praise God for the sanctuary. Amen.